Now 250,000, now everybody get 275, high, everybody get 275, three. Now 300,000, now three and a quarter, 325, high, everybody get three and a quarter, everybody get 325, now half. Now everybody get 300,000. And good morning from Dallas, Texas, at Lincoln Center at the intersection of the LBJ Freeway and the North Dallas Tollway. We uh, welcome you to another edition of the Mike McGavel Jones Show. And we're, um, we've got a lot to cover today. Have a great show, and uh, we've had a big weekend. I do want to send out thoughts and prayers to everyone that was connected to the um, mass shootings this weekend in uh, El Paso and, and also in Dayton. Um, just another week in America. Uh, and, you know, uh, we, I had a chance to watch the president this morning talk about it uh, from the White House. And, and you know, it's just uh, one of those situations that has grown over time, and now we're dealing with decades of it. And uh, obviously there's going to be something done about it, uh, but I don't know. They said there was something like... 400,000 or 400 million guns in America. I don't know. You know, crazy people are crazy people, and, and you're out of the population we have. We have such a large population. There's always going to be someone doing something uh, that's not good for the rest of us. And uh, unfortunately, uh, social media is a big part of it because it's promoted, and then they promote the people that do it, so they have an outlet for their, um, their craziness. So. Anyway, we send out thoughts and prayers. Uh, today, I'm excited to have two of my favorite people, and uh, this is Craig and Angie Meyer. They are professional auctioneers. Um, they are involved in educating auctioneers. They're involved in the association. They're both members of the National and Texas Auctioneers Association, and so good morning. Hey. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Jones. How are you, sir? I'm good, and uh, I'm excited to have you guys on. Well, and uh, Thank you for having us. Yeah. We're glad to be here. Well, I, I want to start. <clears throat> there's we have a lot to cover in in a short period of time. I'm going to start with Angie. Uh, Angie, you grew up in West Virginia. Uh, Southwest Virginia. Southwest Virginia. Is that like West Virginia? It's like God's country. <laughs> <laughs> it's like God's country. Uh, is that somewhere on the eastern part of the United States? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> no, no way. Is that it, way. Is it no, if we South? had if we had a globe, <laughs> let's it's say my head was a globe. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I want you to uh, tell me where you're from and a little bit about your, your childhood. All right. Uh, I grew up in Radford, Virginia. Um, my family is an auction family, a fourth generation auctioneer. Um, my grandfather, my dad, both my brothers are all auctioneers. Um, my grandfather was also a real estate broker. Um, so I grew up in the auction industry, auction business. We did uh, farm sales and estate sales and all that. They also had an auto auction. So I grew up in the auto auction side of things. Um, and we also raised beef cattle. So grew up on a farm all my life. And uh, just. That's cool. Yeah. Brothers and sisters? Yes, sir. I have an older brother, Brian. He's five years older than me. Uh, a younger sister, two years younger, Amanda. And a younger brother, five years younger, Matthew. Mm, lots so, of people. Lots of people. Lots, lots of crazy. <laughs> <laughs> lots of crazy. Oh, we've got more crazy to go. <laughs> we're we're going to talk to Craig now. <laughs> She's a mountain girl. That's all you need to know. I got it. I got it. Well, I always enjoy watching your um, uh, on Facebook when you go go home. Mm -hmm. You know, because it seems to be an adventure. No, it's usually an adventure. I, I bet. That's where my heart's at. I love um, it. So now, how long have you been in Texas? Uh, literally the day that Craig and I got married, I moved here, and that was 18 years ago. Okay, well, hold that. That's another All story. Right. For another <laughs> All time. right. All right, Craig, where were you born? Uh, born in, uh, actually, Fort Worth, Texas, but mm -hmm. uh, out of Ennis, Texas. Okay. Yep. So how did you end up in Ennis? Uh, my dad was a ag teacher. Really? Out of Ennis, yep. I didn't know that. Or yes, if sir. I didn't know it, I forgot about it. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. he was an ag teacher there in Ennis, and you know, born and raised my whole life. I know that... Uh, uh, your grandfather had a lot of influence on you as a young man. Mm, yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Tell me about it. Uh, man, my uh, my grandfather is, uh, well, he's uh, of German descent. Actually, English was his third language. He grew up speaking German and Spanish. Had to learn to speak English when he went to school. He didn't like that very much. Mm. Very old-fashioned, uh, but a good man. Strong man, and, and uh, I was really blessed in my life to have him as a role model and someone, you know, he, that uh, you know, he, he was a rock. You know, always knew I could go to him and, and get a straight answer and somebody you could depend on. Mm -hmm. Sure. 
Well, I remember uh, when we first met, uh, meeting him, and I uh, didn't get to know him very well, but, but whenever he was around, uh, there was obviously a reverence for him, <laughs> much like my grandfather. It's exactly the same situation, only my grandfather was just country. <laughs> he, <laughs> right. he wasn't from another country. <laughs> and he had a hard time speaking English. Not really, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, tell me how you got uh, involved in the auction profession. You know, uh, my dad, I told you, he was an ag teacher, and, and he had played around with auctioneering from when he was younger. Uh, he never got licensed. Um, you know, at the time when I was a kid, he uh, did a lot of benefits and charity. So uh, there in Ennis, uh, you know, there's a... Um, with the Catholic the Catholic Church there in Ennis and there's you know schools it's, charities and benefits are really big where I came from uh, you know anytime somebody gets sick then, you know there was always something but it was never something he thought of for monetary gain um, you know from the financial side of it he enjoyed doing it and and uh, but I grew up watching him do those and, and getting in the ring and, and working those with him I was always fascinated of course we had cattle when I was a kid and and spent a lot of time at the cattle auction as well and my parents will tell you I, I was trying to auctioneer before I knew how to count. So for some reason, when I was a little kid, I, I always wanted to auction. We had an old Farm All M tractor. Of course, didn't have a radio. If you've heard me sing, it's better that I don't. Uh, so I would ride that Farm All tractor around, and, and I remember uh, yeah, re- auctioneering around in circles. You know, a lot of my childhood growing up. So even as a young man, and, and um, the, the girls thought it was cool, and I was I, I like to show off with it, but I never really thought of it as a career. I just love to do it, and I love to uh, I, I love to, to work on that chance. So from the time when I met you, which we'll probably get to, but I I, uh, um, I kind of had a chant growing up, and, and as those charities, from the time I was 13, 14 years old, my dad started handing off some of those little little charities and little fundraisers, and everybody thought it was you know cool to see a little kid get up and auctioneer so really really started auctioneering from a pretty young age um angie what's the first auction you remember going to do you have a recollection uh, in i mean the, it's in always the crib? been it's always been yes yeah. i mean it's always been there was never a first it was just always around no my parents were uh we were very uh we we're a clan and a uh, very hands-on and when mom and dad went to go to an auction we all went together to do it so I mean, I, I don't remember ever not working an auction. I don't ever remember my first auction because it's just always, it's always been a part of our lives. You're probably at an auction, didn't even know you were at an auction. Probably, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but even though, you know, even as young as we were, I mean, because mom and dad grew us, you know, we grew up doing it. Um, th- I never realized, you know, the responsibility that we were actually put on us, I guess, by clerking or, you know, working in the office or registering people or whatever. You know, I always did that kind of stuff with my mom. I never um, was selling or in the ring or anything at that point, but... You know, it's just crazy the amount of responsibility, really, that we were handling mm-hmm. and not and even realizing. As kids. As kids, you know, yeah, as kids. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's kind of the way it was with us, you know. Um, we were, I was a kid mm-hmm. just starting out. Um, speaking of benefits and charities, and we're, we'll talk about all the things that you guys sell and have sold <clears throat> over the last umpteen years, but uh, something that's near and dear to the Texas auctioneer uh, is Texas Scottish Rite Children's Hospital here in Dallas, which is probably 10 minutes south of here. And uh, the Texas Auctioneers Association has designated uh, Scottish Rite as our designated charity of choice, which means we raise money for them. And then we also do a board meeting in December Mm -hmm. every year. And Craig, you have a personal relationship with Scottish Rite. Would you share that a little bit? Uh, Yes. Um, Actually, I've had a couple of surgeries there, so spent some time there. So uh, it's always tugs at my heartstrings anytime. Well, if you haven't been there, you need to go um, and really see what they do at that hospital and those kids that they're helping. And it's just, uh, you know, a like, lot like St. Jude's. It's, just, it's the same thing here in our area. Um, and, uh, man, just do a lot of good for kids that need a lot of help. When I went in and did my surgeries, you know, it really um, changed my attitude in that, you know, you think you're in a bad situation, go there. And I really realized all of the um, – I wasn't really that bad off. I was I was okay. You know, there's there's kids there that have you know a lot worse problems than I had, and and made me kind of shake it off and say, you know, let's move on. So you had a little accident. I did. You want to share it? Sure. Uh, Twelve years old in shop class in school, um, got my hand in a machine called a table joiner, uh, grabbed my pinky and pulled it in and kind of chewed up some stuff. So it took most of my right hand. I have half the pointer finger. Um, at the time, and that was in 1990. So we went a year. They pretty much just kind of patched it up, um, and they were talking about. Uh, I was a. I played baseball. And baseball was a. 
um, big to me at that time, big deal. And um, I, I pitched and caught, and the um, I wanted that second finger back. So they had told me when I did it, well, hey, we're, there's this new thing coming out. We're doing toe-to-hand transplants. And, oh, well, that'd be cool. Well, give me my middle finger back where I can throw a ball better. <laughs> so <laughs> they, and I was trying to throw one at the time, and, you know, with a half a, half an index finger and a thumb, I could throw the ball. I just didn't know where it was going to go. <laughs> so <laughs> so, so um, if I was throwing it over a tank or a pond, you know, I might hit the water. I might not. But um, so, make a long story short, I uh, Scottish Rite. Um, we actually did clean up with my grandfather. He was in charge of the state fair for over 35 years, uh, as far as charge of the state fair. He was over a lot of the cleanup and mm-hmm. changeovers in the in the livestock barns and the Coliseum and the horse barns, Panorama I didn't know Arena. That. So as a, as a young kid, that's where my Spanish comes from. Um, he, you know, he ran crews and did those cleanups. So one of the um, people there that he had worked for for many years, um, I can't can't think of his name. Excuse me, but um, he was with Scott. He was with the Shriners, and they had the Shriners Circus. Mm-hmm. So as a kid, it was the coolest thing. I loved it when the Shriners Circus was at the Coliseum, and I would hang back there and watch the Tigers and watch the people getting ready. Kind of the sure. backstage to the Shriners Circus. And and got to know that one of the one of the gentlemen there that kind of got me got my name on the list to get me in the Shriner because uh, that conversation had happened about that toe to hand transplant. What was going to about a hundred and eighty thousand dollar surgery at that time. So nineteen ninety one, um, they they had they had tried it twice at Dallas Baylor and both of them had failed mm. uh, with two other people. So they said, I tell you what, we're going to take you over here. We're going to do this surgery. We have the best doctors in the world. You're our guinea pig. Get in, uh, get in there. It's free. And I said, okay, sign me up. I said, what's the worst case scenario? Well, you lose a toe. I said, well, I already swim in circles. That's a little bit more going to hurt. So, yeah, we did it. And uh, I was, So I think I was the first successful toe-to-hand transplant person here in Dallas. But uh, And that was done at, you know, a lot of people don't realize this at Shriners. It's, it's not just a hospital. It's some of the you know, the best yeah best of the best yep. and uh yeah they were able to do it that's uh, two microsurgeons 13 hours um well, to, to it, do that surgery if it has uh something to do with a child and uh, bone structure um we we actually show a film at auction school as you know we do a fundraiser every auction school and have since 90 98 i guess maybe 97 somewhere around in there and uh, we'll donate some funds to Scottish Rite, and we also da- donate funds to St. Jude and, and some other groups. But there are there are two primaries for the most part. Uh, go ahead. Well, just to say, <laughs> uh, Shriners, uh, I was already signed up with Scottish Rite. Mm-hmm. So you may not even know this, but uh, I cut uh, about two years later, I cut my uh, pointer finger off my left hand. <laughs> So, what you know got what? Against us. I know. <laughs> I so my parents are so mad. They're like, oh my gosh, Craig, another finger. Well, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, no, but, you never told me that story. Yeah, so they put this one back on for me. <laughs> I, was already, I was already in their system, and boom. As um, soon as it happened, the next day I was in surgery, they put my finger back on. That's pretty amazing. Which I needed. And how did you do that? <laughs> oh, that's a, that's, a, that's a long story longer. <laughs> okay. Um, we'll, we'll stop there. <laughs> I, want to talk, I want to talk about your successes. So um, this is why I can take quarters and halves, and you know we can do so many increments. Oh my God! Mm. Well, I think that's important for people to know because a lot of um, a lot of people have different issues that we don't know about. You know, whether it's your hand or your, you know, it could be your fingers or whatever, your arms, and and uh, the fact that you have done all that you have done in this business, um, and you fought through some things like this. Um, I think that says uh, it says everything you need to know about perseverance and wanting to do something and, and accomplishments and you know I, it's it's not what happens to you it's what you do after it's happened mm-hmm. so well once again the biggest thing Scottish Rite did for me was I sat in there for eight days that first surgery and I looked around and I saw the kids coming out of there coming in and out and some of them were going out you know the way you don't want to go out mm-hmm. some of them couldn't be fixed and. Mm-hmm. The biggest thing Scottish Rite did for me was it helped me understand there's worse problems out there. You know, sure. You know, you're sure. complaining about not having shoes. There's people without feet. And that's the biggest thing Scottish Rite. And, and you know, if we're moving on, that's what I just want to say, that that's, uh, that charity is, is um, it's, it's one of the greatest. And it's a good place to yep. donate to. 
Well, and when we go to Scottish Rite the first Monday in December, mm -hmm. and I think I may have mentioned this on the last show or the one before that, uh, the, the uh, Texas Auctioneers Board will actually meet and have mm -hmm. a board meeting and a luncheon and yeah. and doing uh, the new champion. Our new champion will be doing an auction with with the students. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot the, of fun. The kids, it's fun. yeah, yeah. Fun. I think I've been there. I don't know. Pretty much all of them, but maybe one or two. You know, I, I try not to miss any, but sometimes it's it's very hard. Um, so you, um, I can still remember this, and it happened. It literally happened at the next uh, intersection going west of here at Midway and the LBJ Freeway, where yeah. we used to have the school. Yeah, where your dad came in, uh, your dad Doug came in and brought you, and uh, you registered for auction school. I did. Why don't you tell about that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a it's a funny story. I was in uh, college in Stephenville, and uh, happened to be out one night, and uh, I was doing my talking about doing my chant. Anytime some girls wanted to hear me auctioneer, or somebody wanted to, hey, Craig, auction for us. You know, we used to get that all the time, and I, I never really thought of it as a profession. And so I started auctioneering, and guy taps me on the shoulder. He actually, actually happened to be a guy that lived in the area where my grandfather was from, and. And knew, we knew each other, but never really visited. And uh, he said, man, you, you're you actually a pretty good auctioneer. You sound pretty good. I said, oh, thank you. He said, what are you doing this Saturday? Well, at that time when I was in college, I was working nights at a sandpaper factory and trying to go to college during the day. Um, and uh, so I would think I was working all week at that time for like 200 bucks. Long story short, I went and worked this auction for him. I held stuff up all day, got to sell some boxes at the end. Um, don't tell anybody. wasn't licensed. Let's keep that between us. Great. Uh, but uh, yeah, Great. got to sell a few boxes, and he he wrote me a check for like two hundred fifty dollars. Wow! Was like, wow! Now, who I'm was in the, the wrong who business. Was, who, I need was, to, who was this? I need to get out of the forklift driving <laughs> business and go in the auction business. Uh, his name's Dean Cagle. Uh, he actually owns the the cattle auction there in uh, in Comanche, Texas. Really? Yeah. And um, so Dean had me come out. And we were doing an estate sale, and that's all it was. But uh, he wrote me a check, and I was like, well, I could. This, I work all week for this at nights, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's really what put the idea in my head. And uh, you were in the uh, Yellow Pages. I had an old uh, Yellow Pages back at the back at the house. And what's a Yellow Page? Uh, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> so I flipped through there, found an auction school. I said, I want to go to auction school. I'd heard about it before, and uh, there was a uh, what uh, formerly known as Texas Auction Academy, mm -hmm. now America's Auction Academy, was. Uh, uh, I looked you up, and I think that was like in May or something. And, and three, two or three weeks later, I was in auction school in June. And uh, it changed my life. Really June, of June of 98. June of 98. June of 98. Yep. Well, it was, it was interesting. <laughs> um, why don't you just, just tell the little, because I love little stories. You know, I'm a vignette kind of guy. <laughs> so uh, you came in. Your dad was very, uh, very impressed with your bid calling abilities. Like you were like the greatest thing that ever came along. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know it's funny. Um, my dad had uh, I called my dad and uh, he was living in, in uh, Saxe, which is northeast of Dallas, if you don't know. And um, so I called my dad. I was, you know, I didn't I didn't have a lot of money. I was in college and looking for a place to stay. And and I hadn't, hadn't seen my dad in a little while. And I called him and said, uh, Hey, I'm I'm thinking I'm going to auction school. Um, by the way, I spent like two months of my rent money on on your school, but. Um, he, he knew it. He, he said, oh, he said, he said, Craig, he said, auctioneering's fun and, and, and you're good. And he said, I think you do a good job. He said, but you know, I don't know if you can really make a living in the auction business. He said, I think you need to concentrate on finishing school and doing what you're doing. And I said, well, I've already signed up. I said, can I stay at your house or not? And he said, sure, come on. So, so, uh, so yeah, I stayed with my dad that week, which was good. We uh, hadn't been, hadn't spent much time together in, in a couple of years and, uh, um, so it was kind of you know good uh, good to see him and and stay with him there and and I think it was a you know, twenty thirty minute ride to here but uh, um, yeah he he came in the class he was he was curious about it but he 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 had told me he said I know I know a couple of people that have gone to auction school he said I don't know if they ever sold an auction and and so kind of I think he was worried about me you know as a waste but uh, it wasn't no, the best thing I ever did I I think it's what you make of it <clears throat> tell me about the um what I thought about your chant. <laughs> yeah, that's um, one of my favorite stories. You didn't right? think it, you didn't think it was near as good as I did. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, so um, I can't even do that old chant anymore. I used to kind of keep it in the back of my head, but um, yeah, a lot of holes. And man, I, I remember getting up there and I was going to impress you because because most people that were in the class had never chanted before, and and I thought, oh yeah, 
<laughs> Mr. Jones is going to love this. And boy, I got up and my <laughs> veins were popping out my neck. My face was bright red and I'm just going. You were to a s- super skinny kid, too. <laughs> you know, well, I hadn't eaten in a while. Mike, I spent it on auction school. <laughs> <laughs> I understand you're not the not the yeah. first or the last. You know, a lot of people know this. Yeah, when uh, I, I rode bulls in college and uh, rodeoed, and um, and when I graduated high school, it was pretty much the same height I am now, but I weighed 145 pounds. So, take 60 pounds off this frame, I was yeah, a little, yeah. little lean. You were. I've seen the pictures. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I got up. I was going to impress you with my chant, and uh, I'll never forget. And yeah, Mike said. Uh, you need to throw most of that in the trash. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> Which was an important lesson. I, I actually teach that now uh, when I'm at your at your uh, at your teaching at your school now, and and uh, anybody anytime I'm helping somebody with their chant, I'm like, you, you can't be afraid to take two steps back, and and take something that's not going to work and help you go further. Do, you know, don't ever be satisfied with what you have. Always try to improve it, and and that's the hardest thing for auctioneers, I think. And and you taught me that at that. Whether I liked it or not, or whether I admitted it for a few days, I, I did what you said, and I saw how I was able to take it to another level by throwing some of it in the trash. I mean, yeah. Some of it was never going to get any better. Well, it's the same advice that uh, Neil Davis gave me in, after the international competition in Omaha. I think it was 03, somewhere, or somewhere around there. <clears throat> it's a year that Spanky won, whenever that was. And I just remember uh, I didn't make the top 10 or 15 or whatever it was. And I, and I came off stage, and Neil had been won the championship the year before. And I said, hey, have you got 10 or 15 minutes? And uh, because as I came off the stage that day, he said, you're better than I thought you'd be. I, I don't know what that meant. <laughs> wow. I thought that was, that was the ulti- ultimate insult. That's <laughs> what she said. It was the, compliment, <laughs> the ultimate compliment insult all at one time. <laughs> he was the whole package. I said, would you give me 10 or 15 minutes? And we sat in the restaurant and, uh, for about 10 minutes. And I, I did my auction chant. And I try to do it for the students every once in a while to show them what it did sound like, which is really hard for me to, to try to even revert back and try it. It's mm-hmm. just it's painful. Mm-hmm. But then uh, I did it for him, and he said, you're going to have to get rid of that and this. And same thing. you know. But I'd already been in the business um, from 78 to 2003. So that was a really painful It would transition. have been 93, right? No. With Spanky One. You're talking about oh, the— Oh, 93. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Decades, they just fly by. Well, they do when you're my age. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you for that clarification, time clock. (laughs) Well, I know Um, you won in 98, so. That's true. That's true. What's he doing in there in 90? (laughs) (laughs) When's he competing against me? (laughs) Fact check. (laughs) (laughs) So um, you come to school, you finish up, and uh, and you work some sales with me uh, Mm -hmm. right out of school. And uh, so there was some industrial sales, and I don't even know what all we did back then, to be honest with you. But I do know we, we did Schwegman Grocery Store down in New Orleans, and uh, that was, what, 98, 99? It would be 99. Schwegmans were 99, yep. and then we rolled right into uh, – you did a lot of Western Autos. Well, a lot of Western Autos, and then <clears> – then Montgomery so in 90, Ward. And then 99, we go to uh, uh, Grand Rapids. That's where our convention was in 99. And um, – that's when I got on the NA board. The next year, 2000, roll over to Norfolk, Virginia, and then tell me what happens there. <laughs> well, um, we decided to go to a piano bar to hear some good piano music. <laughs> and <laughs> we maybe, maybe we should let Angie tell us. <laughs> well, Angie, Angie, it's probably your turn to. My <laughs> turn to tell it? Yeah. Oh, it's kind of funny how I ever in, uh, ended up there. My dad was in the competition. You know, uh, the NAA, their convention is held in a different state every year, a different city every year. And it just so happened in 2000, it was in Norfolk. And uh, I told you we're a clan, and I'll do everything together. Family bonding time. Dad's like, hey, I'm going to enter the contest. Everybody want to go? So my uh, brother and sister-in-law at the time had a set of twins, and uh, the rest of us, we didn't have any children at that point, of course. So anyway, we're like, oh, yeah, we'll go. Sure, sounds like fun. And end up going down with Dad to, you know, encourage him and cheer him on in the contest. And um, anyway, met uh, Johan Graham out of California. Her and her sister was going out that night and asked if I wanted to come. Ended up in the dueling piano bar. And there it is. I probably need to take over from here. It's all history from there. Do not. (laughs) (laughs) He always says that I had taken a microphone off of somebody. Oh, I had not. He always says that. She was singing. You were there. I was there. <laughs> she was singing. I was there, which is really weird because, you know, I, 
I don't know how I ended up there, you know. <laughs> that, we didn't either. Yeah, either. <laughs> that was probably a story in well, itself. Well, she had her clan. I usually just kind of went around with anybody that had me. <laughs> just so happened to be with y'all that night, Mike. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I thought David Williams with Buddy Buddy Thomas. Uh, oh, I know we had a whole gosh. we had a whole crew there. Yep. And uh, Texas crew was walked there. in, and this hillbilly girl has taken the mic, and she is singing a jewel song. And <laughs> I did not take the mic. I'm not saying did. I didn't sing the song. I did sing the song, but I did not take the mic from the guy singing. For sake of argument, don't talk on me. Um, <laughs> so, so the this guy's like reaching. Desi, it's like Desi and yeah, Lucy on so, his country version. Yeah, <laughs> you, you know, the um, rest is history. Yep. Um, so th- yeah. that's 2000. Yes. And we all escape and get yes. back, back to where we belong. Yes. Mm-hmm. And then uh, how long was it before you guys got married? Uh, March. March. March is a long way to go to court, and I need <laughs> it's a lot of gas money <laughs> driving back and forth short. to Virginia. Cut it short. <laughs> so, yeah, I think I went back up there a month later. Uh, I told her, you know, we, we hung out all week. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't think she liked me because I'd, I'd say, hey, you want to go, you know, at the convention, hey, you want to go to dinner, you want to go, we'll go to take you to. She'd say no. She'd say no. No, no, no. She'd always say yes, yes, I'd love to. And Uh-oh. then she'd show up with her, her all her brothers and sisters <laughs> and her mom. And <laughs> so I was like, <laughs> coming with me. You want to go to go to the movies? Yeah, I'd love to. And then like eight of them show up. And I'm like, oh my gosh. Where's, well, here's the Hatfields. Where's the McCoys? So, so we, uh, so yeah, I didn't know. So by the end of the week, though, we we were hitting it off pretty good. And and uh, I said, I'll, I'll come to Virginia. I'll come see you. She said, Yeah, yeah, I'm sure he will. So I said, Okay, well, hide and watch. Now, where did you get married? Um, we got married in Virginia, mm-hmm. and uh, immediately after we got married, um, I have to get ahead of you, but is that where we're headed? Well, it's it's all on one line. It says marriage <laughs> dash Montgomery Ward. Okay, well, bam, right there, I'm falling in place. There we go. So yeah, so um, we uh, got married, and and we left the that night of the wedding and drove straight from Radford, Virginia, to uh, was it Laredo or McAllen? I don't remember the first one or Far or Harlingen. Uh, we did that little run setting up Montgomery Ward store. So I'd been setting up sales for you for a couple of years, and and uh, you pretty much <laughs> said, "Hey, all right, here, newlyweds, yeah. um, <laughs> go to work." So we were getting y'all were. <laughs> I've sell- never been to a border town, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So yeah, I think we when we were across the border and um, um, she had never been. We were, we we're just kind of walking along the street and doing some shopping and. A guy comes up and says something to me in Spanish. He goes, what does he want? I said, he wants to sell some cocaine. <laughs> so she said, let's get out of here. I said, okay. <laughs> All right. Buy some of them frogs and let's go. But uh, so, yeah, so we, we would get ahead of you, mm-hmm. and uh, we were doing your setup, and y'all were coming in a date. A lot of times, well, how many of those were there? Forty-some-odd of them? Yeah. And uh, we had that southern southern branch, and um, I guess you put me down there for the Spanish reasons. But um <laughs> but I was getting ahead of you, and, and we were staying a day or two ahead of you. But, uh, you know, th- okay. thanks for the confidence because I was, you know, a 20, 22 year old kid, and you had me and my newlywed wife, and I knew. Uh, if she didn't leave me in that first six weeks, <laughs> that, uh, that that she was going to work out. But yeah, we spent. Well, it was, it was pretty brutal. I mean, it was a brutal schedule because there was, you had to set it up and then literally leave and go do another one mm-hmm. because we we're just a freight train <laughs> following you, mm-hmm. you know. Oh, yeah. And 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 then uh, did y'all clerk it or did we clerk it? Uh, we didn't work a level of lot. We were lot setting up. Months. We were just setting you were just setting up. straight ahead. We'll of see. You. What we ended up having to do is we'd have to go in and we're we're trying to get these sheets processed. Literally, I thank God we lived in a time when you could afford a pickup that had electric power in the back, mm-hmm. and we literally had people in the back seat typing the catalogs, arriving at the town, mm-hmm. and then going straight to uh, Kinkos. We were there a day before you putting uh, putting every putting it in lots, lotting and tagging. Yeah, sending we y'all and we were sending y'all a list yeah, and that's you, it that's, that's it. how we were doing it yeah. y'all were sending us the list yeah. but i know uh far and and brownsville and laredo and san antonio and all those she's, wow. she's, like, she's like is this my honeymoon I was like, <laughs> <laughs> where, where are we going tomorrow well just we're going somewhere well you, and the other thing is in our business you know when our vacation is that's called a convention right right <laughs> that's our that's our you know that's our it changes over time for some people not for everyone, but it's for some people. Funny story. Uh, yeah, I remember being scared to call you because uh, we were, I think we were in Harlingen. And I mean, it, that one was pretty close just in. And we were staying at this uh, 
Motel Six. I think you were booking our rooms, and we get to this Motel Six, and <laughs> nothing we, but the best. Nothing but the best. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I thought, I, hey, for me at that time, <laughs> just, I was, yeah, the you're hotel just glad was, to have a room. It was great. Well, you know, they keep the light on. <laughs> so, so I remember that I, I called you, and you know, we had, actually that night we got in late. And I think we didn't finish that setup till y'all were coming in the next morning. It's like eleven o'clock at night, and we go and it's, we go upstairs and, and in our room and pull back the Angie. I never check my. I, I've never checked a bed in my life, and she's. <laughs> I, I, she taught me that night that that's worth it but she pulls it back and it looks like a gorilla two gorillas had a wrestling match and then there's hair all over the sheets and she's like oh my god i'm not staying in here and I, you know i'm like ah just brush it off it'd be fine and she's like i am not staying in here we are like, rolling and, and, and she said she said you are calling mike jones and we are not staying in anymore i shouldn't have said their name I, it's a good hotel chain i'm sorry but uh they leave a lot on for you and everything i've always loved them but uh but yeah so i called i had to call it's, you it's, hey it's I'm factual it's factual, factual. Oh. So I, I called you. I was like, oh, Mr. Jones, do um, you think maybe we could go to a Super 8? Or <laughs> could we upgrade? Best Western, maybe? It's our honeymoon, for crying out loud. <laughs> well, I can assure you, if you ever set up another sale, <laughs> I'll put you up at, the, at, a, Hilton, at a Hilton yep. property. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> I've never heard that story. <laughs> Oh. True story. All right, so we move along, <clears throat> and you decide to get in the auction business, <clears throat> and um, and then you guys went down. Of course, you were already in Ennis, so you've got a you've got a family ranch down there. Tell me how. Tell me tell me about the ranch and how that all came about. Yeah, um, you know, we lived in Stephenville when we first got married, and but we were working in Dallas all the time, and and uh, was wearing out pickups and starting to get into the auto business. And she was clerking with me, and I was ringing and starting to sell. And this is a uh, one. Um, we decided why don't we move closer to dallas we, we drive to dallas every day so i love stephenville we still have a place in stephenville we, we love to go out there but just we're you know just wear and tear driving two hours each way sure. so uh we decided i said well i grew up in ennis let's let's move back so we had a little rent out stayed in ennis a little while um long story short we found this property in 02 um is is uh the original track was 540 acres and had three houses on it it was in it was an old dairy um and uh we kind of made a leap of faith we really couldn't afford it at that time but uh felt like we could work it and we've built you know raised cattle on it and felt like it could pay for itself actually it's probably one of the best things we ever did but yeah we've been there been there ever since and and uh um how many acres now um that track is 600 we, we added one um one little piece to it but pretty much the same yep so you're running some cattle on it yes and you have your friends over we have our friends over you know it rained yesterday you know, we had talked about not enough me coming uh, coming down. Well, it rained where I was, <laughs> so I go. Well, I'm not going to go down there. And <laughs> you know, get we're lightning we're strikes or we're something. We were standing there with our hands folded. Please, please, <laughs> come on. So, well, the people to the north got the rain. Yeah. It wasn't you. So uh, you get in the auction business. Now you guys got into the auto auction business. You're selling cars. You're working at the auto auction. And they, they, you know, how did you transition? Uh, over to being an auctioneer at the auto auction uh i was clerking well let's back up okay you came to auction school i did came yep. to auction school in 03 yep i did and um then uh yeah so i was clerking at the auctions uh craig and i were kind of working the same schedule so it worked out great with that and uh, i was working one of the fastest lanes craig and i worked together quite a bit and uh working one of the fastest lanes at the auction and i knew that the top paid uh block clerk got paid 115 dollars and i was making 105 dollars and i went in to ask for that 10 dollar raise and they told me no and i was like you know what <laughs> now, during this time though you know craig and i would have conversations on the way home and i would watch the ringman and and see how he and you know and the ringman would work together and how craig would call him and and you know let him know hey check jose or hey check, you know what i mean or whatever is you know it's bill's car you know ask him what it takes whatever like i was just picking up on all the things that he was saying to his ringman and sometimes the ringman would follow him and sometimes he wouldn't and it just kind of got in my head that you know i, I can do that and plus it would be a, a pay raise as well mm -hmm. and um just got real lucky uh barry roop uh gave me a nissan factory job that i was working every other month to get some experience because that was the hardest part trying to get some experience sure. on the floor just to so somebody would take you serious you know because there's not many women that work at the auto auctions and i wanted to be taken serious for sure and they had seen me on the block you know clerking for so long you know it was kind of a weird transition but it was awesome i uh, worked on a uh, was able to do an early bird sale clinton joey sherman was working it and uh, they let me get at the back end of the car and watch how they work together they're a world champion team and got to learn from them and 
uh, just things started falling into place and one sale which I would tell Craig oh it's never gonna happen I'm never gonna get any ringing jobs and then one would more and more fall into place and next thing you know I was working probably five five a week and then from there just started started trying to work my way on the block yep so never well, satisfied <laughs> <laughs> well I watched it happen and um, <clears throat> you're a great auctioneer. Thank you. And it's been fun to watch. Um, uh, and, and it's unique to have a couple that can keep the marriage together, work together, and do all the things that you do. I mean, it, nothing's easy. Nothing's easy in the world. But I think uh, you guys make it look a lot easier probably than it is. <laughs> you know. We have a lot of fun. It has been a well, lot crazy. You know what? If you can't have fun, um, mm-hmm. why do it? So then you win the rookie championship in in 05. When did you run the, the Texas rookie? 99. So you won the Texas rookie in 99. So really if you kind of watch the progression here, um you you both did the same things. You came to auction school, you entered into the contest, you got involved with the the associations. Um in 2000 and well when did you win the Texas championship? Uh the state of when the auctioneer in 11. But I won the ringman in 07. In 07. Mm-hmm. So I'm looking here <clears throat> In 2007, I happened to be in Denver, Mm -hmm. uh, just by happenstance. I was there doing a St. Jude auction downtown, and uh, I I told Lori, I said, hey, let's, you know, I forgot they're having the World Auto Auction Championship here, and it was like we had, we had like some time to kill, and uh, so we came out to the auto auction, Mm -hmm. uh, and about the time that you guys were, were doing your thing, and then the way it worked out, I got to watch you win the World Auto Auction Championship and the Team Championship yeah, all at one time. Yeah. That was uber cool. Yeah, and I uh, looked up and saw you were there. I was like, oh, this is awesome. Yeah, it really meant a lot to me that you were there. It was cool. But it did it for worked me. Out. It did for me. We, we, we almost swept it that year. Um, I think you were third or in the ringman, and we won the team and won the auctioneer. That would have been yeah, it used to be crazy, a two day, it was good. It used to be a two-day contest, and I, by Friday, Friday night, I was sitting first, but... You know, they had had a contest in California at that time um, for what they did the payout um, for the winning the world, I think was 10000 at that time. And somebody wanted to start another contest in California, so they came out with this big uh, $12,500 prize money. <laughs> so Paul Bear said, eh, eh, nay, nay, you're not going to be a bigger payout than I am. And that year he happened to bump it up to fifteen <laughs> to blow this guy out. And uh, then we won the team. So you should have told me. I could have said I was starting one. <laughs> so <laughs> we could have got you 20. <laughs> I know. Would have been a good idea. Uh, uh, but uh, so And then we won the team, so we both got that. And then she won prize money for third. Uh, all saying all that to say this, it was a pretty big payday, um, you know, our, that contest that year. So we decided, you know what, we're, we're gone all the time. We, we had a nanny in the you know, we love our kids and spend a lot of time as much as we could. But at that time, we were on the road a lot, and so we decided, you know what, we're going to take this money. We want to give back to the kids, and and uh, so uh, we built a pool. So it is called the pool that Paul Bear built. <laughs> <laughs> We've Paul, thought about Paul. getting a mosaic in the bottom, but I haven't found the right artist. <laughs> Paul will appreciate that. Right. Oh, that's funny. That's funny. Uh, the, you won, or did y'all, I, I don't know the order of this, in 2009, another team championship was there? Uh, it was, you know, um, David Ray is a dear friend of mine from childhood, and uh, I had won in the team with Angie, with Angie in 07, and I wasn't going to compete anymore, you know, right. and uh, he came to me, he, he, he worked for me at the auto sales a lot, and he said, Greg, I want to enter the team, but I don't want anybody with else but you. So I said, okay, let's, let's do it. So we entered the team that year, and uh, I was in Pennsylvania. San, F- no, that was Florida. Um, it was Pennsylvania. It was Pennsylvania, but I'm trying to think of the town. But anyway, um, we had, uh, yeah, won the team uh, with David Ray in 09. But, uh, I think it was Lockhart. Is that something? That right? is right. Yeah. So, in, um, so you had a lot of success, and the, the auto auction, you have a lot of friends in the auto auction industry. Um, in 2013, of course, you'd gotten, both of you have been real active with the Texas Auctioneer Association. <coughs> In 2013, you were president of the association. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. I started on the board in 2003, so I had a 10-year stint. Okay. So you were 2011, was your? Was that right? I uh, started on the board in 2003 and uh, got on. I think I started working uh, on chairs uh, then. Uh, according to <laughs> my sources, <laughs> it was 2013, but if it wasn't, we don't care. <laughs> no, I was president in 13. Um, and somewhere in here, you learned to fly a helicopter. And I don't know why. And then you offered uh, to let me ride with you, 
and knowing all the surgeries you've had with your hands, <laughs> I wasn't really sure. Yeah, nobody's ever thought it was a good idea that I climb in a helicopter, but you know, tell knock me, on wood. Tell me how that all, tell me so, what your interest was in helicopters and why you decided to do that. Well, um, you know, I told you we, we bought the farm uh, in, in 02. Be careful when you say that. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Knock on wood again. Yes. Yes. Um, so uh, we bought the ranch in 2002. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, when we bought our place, um, our house kind of sits up on a hill, kind of overlooks the place, kind of runs down into a big draw. But it, it uh, our front yard was tore up with pigs. And I, would, you know, I asked him, what happened to the yard? And, oh, that's wild pigs. I was like, wild pigs? What are you talking about? There wasn't pigs in that area. That's how fast they've grown in Texas. And uh, at that time, I graduated in 1995. and 2002, seven years later, you know, they're digging up people's yards, apparently. So we came back to town. And we bought the place. And I really didn't know how bad of a problem it is. So I told you we were kind of struggling with money. And we wanted to raise cattle. So all of it was in cultivation. So we spent a lot of money. Um, putting it back into grass and so we get this process started and I get these nice pretty stands in these pretty green fields and I go out there and um, I know in one instance I had a 40 acre field they just annihilated I had to back drag it with a bulldozer just so I could get a tractor so I could plow they're, they're, people don't know how devastating they are um, so the only thing you can do is you set your alarm clock for midnight you, you go out there back in those days we didn't have all these uh, tactical weapons and night vision and thermals and all this and you've got a you're in your underwear and you got a spotlight and you got a bolt action <laughs> rifle and you drive up in your truck and there's 35 pigs in a field or you go let me, let me back up you go out there at midnight there's no pigs you set your alarm for two in the morning you go back out there too there's no pigs you set your alarm you go back out there at four in the morning finally there's 38 pigs well i don't care how good you are you shoot three with in your underwear with a with a spotlight and a rifle and all they do is they run over on your neighbors and then they chew him up for a little while and then he shoots at them and then they come back on you so it, it's it really you can't describe how horrific it is and and to say all that to say this i've got an auction <laughs> i've got a, in the yeah, morning yeah. so it i love to hunt and i, lo- and I love the outdoors and I, I love all of that shooting and everything but um i uh I like to sleep too, so um, and I don't like my you know, thousands and thousands of dollars worth of damage. So I'm telling you all that to tell you this: um, I was going to town one day with my young son. Uh, I think Rody was six or seven at the time. This was in '09, and um, I'm going to town. And we used to pay the state, so we would pay in a supplemented uh, deal that the state does. Um, and I had a buddy of mine sitting on the road, and he was I thought he was broke down. He was out of his truck, thought he had his phone in his hand. Turns out to be a radio. I pulled over. I said, hey, Jason, I said, everything okay? He said, uh, well, they're fixing to push some pigs through here. I said, what do you mean push some pigs through here? He said, uh, helicopter. I was like, what? He said, they got a helicopter. The state sent a helicopter to kill some of these pigs. No kidding? So we pull over. Sure enough, they run pigs right across the road and into the field across the road. Shot like 23 of them and all of them. And I was like. <laughs> I got that little grin on my face, and uh, I said, uh, I'm going to do that. And my buddy said, yeah, it does look like fun, doesn't it? And I called him on Monday uh, and said, yeah, I'm in helicopter school. Same thing happened with Angie when, when we went to town and we ended up coming back home. I said, Angie, I know what I want to be when I grow up. She says, what's that? I said, I want to get me a helicopter, and I want to fly around and shoot these pigs. I hate pigs. They have, The pigs have definitely <laughs> pissed the wrong guy off at this point. So um, I said, I want to get it. So um, she goes, ha, 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 that's funny. And I called her on Monday as well. said, um, I'm over here in Garland, this guy helicopter. I said, uh, um, I'm learning to fly. I said, I'm in, I'm in helicopter school. She said, You're, you weren't kidding. I said, you've doubted me before. Don't doubt me. So uh, that's how all that started. Um, the first couple of years, we signed up farms. You know, we, Angie will tell you, we literally would have farmers on a Sunday morning before church lined up in our kitchen wanting to sign up for something, some yeah. sort of help. And uh, I think that first six weeks when we first rolled out the carpet and said, here's what we're going to do, I th- we had 100,000 acres, you know, just like that. Wow. And uh, people wanted to – so that first couple of years, I charged them a dollar an acre, and I, I I didn't put a penny in my pocket for years. But when we first started, I, I spent it all on ammo and, 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 and pilots. I, I, figured out when, I figured out when I learned to fly, maybe I don't need to be flying doing this. Maybe I'll be better shooting. So I don't fly when we're pig hunting, but uh, fuel, pi- helicopter, and all that, we uh, – and uh, we we shot uh, like 1,900 pigs that first month, mm-hmm. and it wow. was the first time that we saw a significant difference in damage. And it's we it, it, we changed it in our area, no mm-hmm. doubt. Um, they passed a law in 2011. I thought we weren't gonna. The, they passed a law in 2011 called the Pork Chopper Bill. So the uh, the Pork Chopper Bill allowed for you to to be a an outfitter and take people up and let them pay the bill. 
So it took the financial responsibility off the off the, the landowners and put it on the shoulders of the willing, which are yep. sportsmen. So long story short, uh, it's been great. It's been a great business. We, we have over 700,000 acres now that we have under contract. Um, and um, we run that business about eight weeks out of the year. So it's not it's not all year. Um, but uh, it's significant. So, <clears throat> and I'll, I'll, correct me if I'm wrong, um, I don't know a ton about the business, but um, you shoot these pigs, and uh, can they be dressed out and, and given away, or what do you do? What, what happens to the pigs after you kill them? <laughs> yes, you, you can. Um, some things have changed. You know, when we first started, we didn't want to waste them. So we had an association with a company called Hogs for a Cause, and it was a mission-based organization where they – they had the resources. I didn't have the resources to take it all the way to packages of sausage. Yep. You, in this day and age, you you can't say you can't call up the single mom down the road and say, "Hey, do you 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 want some pork?" And she says, "Oh, I'd love some. It, it would help her family." Yep. And then you just go drop a hog carcass off in her backyard. She, <laughs> they don't know what to do with it. <laughs> so you know, we needed to take it that extra step and actually, where you hand her frozen meat. So. Yep. Um, they they had the resources and people that were donating their time and when we use them um there's also some outlets uh where uh near us you know necessities the mother of invention so they've taken it where they're starting to um grind the pigs and use them for protein for like animal foods dog food stuff like that yep. um and and they have some different different resources uh, i won't say we pick them all up and a lot of the areas we pick them we can't get to um, the hogs for a cause they've actually gone on and gotten enough donations they were we had a tv show for a while so they were on that and they've gotten really well known so they they've created uh they're actually usda approved now and so they they don't they don't want our helicopter shot at pigs anymore i guess long story short people people bring them pigs that are live and trapped and they can process them just like uh, any other processor so, so you did a uh you, you alluded to the show hella hunters mm -hmm. tell me about that real quick um had a lot of fun. Uh, Real, uh, Reality-based show. Reality-based show. But, you know, the cool thing about what we're doing, there, there's not a lot of contrived drama needed with the <laughs> business that we were in. Yep. Our reality is, was entertaining enough. So um, we had a lot of fun with it. Uh, Terrell Coleman is an auctioneer, uh, a lot of y'all might know, and, and a good friend of mine. Uh, but uh, at that time, we were partners in the, in the business, and we had a lot of fun doing the show. And um, But just the, the biggest thing we wanted to show was – you know, we're not a bunch of crazy rednecks flying around slaughtering animals and, and having fun. Right. I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. It's fun. But it was it, a reason. It is a reason. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't do it if, if it wasn't needed. Have you ever heard of what the numbers are as far as how much damage the hogs would do in a year? Yes, um, and it's estimated. Uh, the best things we've found is through uh, AgriLife, which is the Texas A&M. Mm -hmm. um, you know, their numbers that came out. Now, it's been many years since I've really kind of looked at it, but uh, they were saying that uh, there was estimated 3 to 4 million pigs in Texas. Now, they average 50 to $500 per pig annually in damage. So we just kind of took an average on that and said well let's just take the smaller scale of it but you know even if you say it depends on where the pigs are if a pig is eating a corn crop that's yep. already established and ready to harvest that's more of the higher end of that if they're just digging some holes in pasture land and you have to go plow it every now and then that's the smaller yep. numbers but it, it's it's significant you, uh, you created a lot of relationships too because of it uh you met uh, and you had ted nugent on <laughs> i know he he came down and um um I'm sure you've met a lot of other people with the means to, to get up and fly around and, and have some fun with that as well, you know, because everything we do is relationships, everything, Absolutely. everything we do, for, whether it's the owners of the car dealerships, uh, the people who are behind them, uh, it's all relevant. And that you're one of the things as auctioneers, as you know, uh, our network, our book of business, our network is worth a lot. You know, I mean, there's people that would die to have our connections. And I think that's... Uh, that's part of it. So in 2016, you won the U.S. Bid Calling Championship. Yes, sir. Correct. In 2016, you won the Lone Star Open. Yes, sir. That's pretty good. You're, That's a good you're, year. You're cashing checks like crazy. <laughs> you know, that the downside is when you win, it's over. It's over. Yeah. yeah. I, it has you, been. Well, it's not just that. Um, the cash flow <laughs> <laughs> is cut back. Um, I mean, I've got a I've still got more I want to cover, but I want to ask you both, and I'll ask Angie first. What What do you think makes a great auctioneer? Hmm. Well, 
I think that I think the relationships, just what you're talking about, is it makes a great real, uh, auctioneer. I think you know it, whether you know the crowd that you're dealing with or you don't, you build in that relationship with them just when that first you know 15 minutes to an, you know 30 minutes that they they understand where you're. I think you teach an, uh, a crowd kind of how to how you want them to bid to you and and just that they know that you're I think being ethical I think being professional I think um and having fun I mean I think that's what it's all about I mean um I think just being honest having integrity I mean also I forgot to um um mention that you won you were the first to win the uh, international ringman championship Mm -hmm. with the national auctioneers association it was in my notes I don't know how I missed that but uh that was pretty cool yeah. and for you to come out the first year the very first year uh and 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 beat all the guys let's just put it like it is you know uh, there was probably some humble pie running around there <laughs> <laughs> that was some really good hands showed up you, there. you were you were probably not that popular no, i was not that no, popular i don't think no, no. Th- that's okay but it was fun well that's all right you know it, everybody needs to be humbled every once in a while yeah. what makes a great champion what I think, I the key word in that question, what makes a great auctioneer, makes a great uh, champion, is the word makes. I mean, that's what everybody wants to know. I think that a passion for the business and the love for what we do, and you could incorporate in, I, I use that a lot when I'm teaching, is, is, is attitude. It's your attitude that determines your altitude, not your aptitude. And having the right attitude or having a passion for the business and putting your heart and soul in everything that you do is what I think makes not only somebody a great auctioneer, it makes you a great real estate agent it makes you a great preacher whatever position you're in but i see so many auctioneers that just don't have the right attitude and they're never going to get any better they're not going to go any further they're they're happy with their 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 you know complacent in what what they have and what they are and having uh, having a passion for the business and really loving what you do i think what it takes to 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 really make yourself better <clears throat> you're both active members in the national and texas auctioneers association and i'm assuming you've been members ever since you got out of auction school yes, sir. right mm-hmm. you paid my first membership <laughs> thank you <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> no that's, well you know how i feel about it mm-hmm. tell me how you feel about it because angie you are currently on the board of directors and um you are first vice president right now yes sir yeah so you you unless you um screw up like nixon <laughs> right <laughs> i'm going to be president yeah. you'll be president one right. of these days yeah. yeah 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 it's exciting i love uh, i love being on the board i um i've been on the board for a while uh and I just love giving back. I love uh, thinking of new, um, innovative ways. I like seeing the change that our industry takes, and I like being, um, I like being a part of of that change, and and uh, just helping, just helping in the leadership role of of where our association's going or where our business as a whole as auctioneers goes. It's nice to be kind of on the forefront of that. Well, it's been, <clears throat> it's, it's very, um, it makes me feel good to see what you guys are doing. Because, you know, I, I tried to lead by example over the years and to see you guys picking up and you doing it. You're the leaders now. You guys are the ones that are sponsoring things and showing up and being there. And you got to have leaders. Mm-hmm. And um, so tell me your position on that. Well, um, people did it for me. Um, if, if it wasn't for the associations, you know, you, you know, when I came to your school, I didn't know anybody. It wasn't for you. And I, I think one of my first sales out of school was Scott Swenson. And. Um, I kind of caught on real quick. I, my first convention was in 1998, which was uh, two weeks after I got out of auction school. And uh, coincidentally, was just our last association. It was the last time we've been there, you know, 21 years later. But um, I, it's important to me on the associations that they're still around to help the young kid like me that wants to be an auctioneer, wants to be successful in the business, doesn't have the means, doesn't have the knowledge, doesn't have the know-how and doesn't even know the route to get there, and which was what was what that was me, um, and to be able to come and ne- really, you, though your dad did kind of mess around with the auction thing and do some benefits and stuff, you really are a first generation real auctioneer in your family, right? It, it was my you know it, I was inspired yeah. by that, but it was really my route to I wanted to make my living in the auction business, and no, I had no no knowledge of any of that um but to have the networking opportunities and and everybody was so good to me and i was i was i was kid i was young and and kind of a, a mascot maybe you know it's um you know kind of uh, you know there's greg and uh but i could call anybody in that association and say how do i do this how do i sell this while how- we while we have a moment uh, name off just a few of those people 
that helped you along the way because it it, it I think it matters to mention people uh, I, I I always tried to thank people and the only thing the only error that I hate is when I've forgotten someone that I meant to mention mm-hmm. and then it's like oh, you know, mm-hmm. and, and you'll, you'll have those situations. But who are some of your influences? You know? <laughs> to be honest, I don't have enough fingers to, <laughs> to name them all. Uh, honestly, um, you know, you were a big part uh, of me coming up. I uh, always owe you for that. Uh, Scott Swenson. But, uh, you know, a lot of them aren't with us anymore. Um, you know, Miles Autry was always had a special place in my heart. And Jim Sample um, loved Jim. Jim loved me. He, he, yep. always, he always took care of me. And, uh, um, and uh, yeah, yeah, yep, Dell Lemons, love Dell Lemons. I mean, there's so many of those guys, man. They were, you know, I'm. They're in a position where they really just to contribute. That we, I, I like to say, I, you know, I love them. They love me. But there's a lot, a lot of people that I'm, you know, Pat Long, uh, Scott Swinson, uh, a lot of people that I could call and, and get information from. And um, that association, and, and like I said, unfortunately, you know, a lot of these guys that were around when I first got started aren't, aren't with us anymore. Um, but that's why it's so important for, you know, to us to, to be a part of it in, in, in any, any way that's needed to kind of help carry it on. And I hope I can be for up-and-coming auctioneers what they were for me. Yeah, well, I think you both – I think you both are doing exactly what you need to be doing when it comes to influencing and, and uh, helping uh, influence young auctioneers. That's one of the things that we need now, and we're really working hard with the National Association and the State Association to promote helping people get started mm-hmm. because, um, you know, the more the more on board, the more time you hear the word auction, the more auctions there are. Mm-hmm. And as you know, there's a shift to online auctions in a, in a lot of circumstances. And so the, the live auction is, of course – where you and I and Angie and, and, you know, our core friends, that's what they do. That's how they make their living. And so we want to continue to be advocates for uh, the live auctioneer. But knowing the online component is here to stay, it's not going back in the bottle. So um, we just had this conversation. I just had it on a previous show with Scott Swenson because, you know, most of his business has gone the way of the online uh-huh. auction. Uh-huh. You know, and it, it, it's, it, it, for him, it's purely, he'll tell you, it's, it's economics and I've said for a long time, auctioneers, whether you're online or whether you're selling live, we make our living selling mostly live auctions. We don't do an outside sale without utilizing the Internet anymore, yep. not only in marketing, but we do live simulcast. People that do online only, what I feel over the years, I've always said this, even before online was a part of it, auctioneers, some of them, some auctioneers are so competitive that they, um, you know, bicker amongst each other and what we all need to understand is if you help each other that's what the association taught me growing up if you help each other we all do a better job we all help the industry and it's better for all of us and i don't want to cat fight with people that believe in online auctioneering just because i mostly do live auctions i i i think it's important that they educate themselves and they do a good job auctioneering and i hope they uh, and i hope they they you know they do well sure so uh, i i i want I hope everybody understands that even the online auctioneers, the live auctioneers, we're all on the same team. Yep. We're all in the auction industry. So well, I'd like to see <clears throat> more online auctioneers become a part of our association. Mm-hmm. True. And some have, some have not. But a lot of the um, online auctioneers don't even really realize there is an association because they're just out there using a, a platform. So anyway, that's another discussion for another time. I want to talk about the ringman and how important the ringman is and uh, you guys have gotten uh, in very involved in and, and been a part of starting a uh, um, a ringman school and so i'm going to let you tell me about the world champion ringman college uh tell me about tell me about that how it started who's involved and how you you know how you're contributing to that now uh, yeah absolutely um we're actually very excited about it we've we've been going a year now i uh, have a class upcoming october 4th through the 6th so it's um basically a three-day class half a day on the first day and and uh and pretty much a half on the third so but it's three days um and uh you know we really got the idea of instructing w- through your school america's auction academy we've mm-hmm. been doing the ringman training for there for years mm-hmm. um and you have so much to teach in auction school. I mean, they've got to learn so much. You, you, you teach so much business, so much marketing, so much. 
and but the guys that want to get out there and really be um, a live auctioneer it's a very hard business to get into if you don't have any experience nobody will hire you if nobody hires you you can't get any experience and so we've always felt that there needs to be more ringman training because most auctioneers that want to get out if you want to come and work at an auto auction you're more than likely never going to just get stuck on the block yep. so you i had to angie had to most everybody we know had to work their way up through ringing and and the in especially in um registered cattle and in, in, in some of the upper end you know ringman they can make a lot of money just ringing i know you know we know lots of great friends that make a great living just professional ringman and never aspire to auction so you know that's offered for them as well but most anybody that's going to work their way up and be an auctioneer needs to learn to ring and we wanted to be able to take an, an auction student or maybe somebody that's even been we have a world champion coming to our next class because he's from the northeast and they don't use ringman and he's starting to work sales uh, in other parts of the country where ringman are utilized more and he doesn't he wants to learn how to use them he not only wants to learn how to use them he wants to learn how to train them so I mean, like I said, we, it, it, we, we're going to train at all levels, but we want to take somebody that doesn't know, we, we, we literally have, that doesn't really even know how to ring at all, and in three days, we've shown we can take them and take them to the next level where we literally had a student that was struggling just to keep bids separated, mm-hmm. um, and three days later, I think two weeks later, she went and got a job in an auto auction, uh, which is unheard of, but um, the... Uh, I mean, and before, I mean, yeah. somebody that didn't have have experience working is to go get a full time job. That that's their goal. That that I'm it's really the, really proud of that. Well, that's the best money she ever spent. <laughs> it was. Um, but uh, basically, the Riemann College is about taking and learning techniques and learning how to go to the next level. Most, you know, if if you don't know, a lot of people just ringing. I call it ping ponging. You're just going from one bidder to the next, one bidder to the next. But there's a there's a lot more to it. A lot more. We do a lot of listening drills. We do. Um, you know, that, that's the biggest part of it is teaching them to, to listen and hear and know what's going on in the ring without actually seeing it. Mm-hmm. So. Um, a side note before I finish on the, the Ringman College, um, you, how long have y'all been teaching at the auction school, America's Auction Academy? How long do you think you've been coming? 15 years? Probably. 10, 10 probably, 15 years? Probably 15 years. Yeah. 12, 15. Yeah, you probably deserve a plaque. Um <laughs> <laughs> can hang it you at know, the Motel you, 6. You know, you know well, it, it may mention Motel <laughs> 6. Um, one of the things, you do the ring work with the students, mm-hmm. which is great. They love that. You know, and, and, of course, we take them to an auto auction. We've taken them years ago. We were at Odessa for a long time. And then we went to, uh, we went to Mannheim for probably 20-something 20, 20 years, and, and now we're going up to Louisville. And, uh, you know, we have a great relationship with all the auto auctions and uh but you also um, work with the students uh on their spanish uh because Mm -hmm. you know we're we are a border state and we get a lot of uh, spanish-speaking individuals a lot of buyers at the auto auctions and other auctions i mean they're they are a big part of our demographic um why don't you give them a little sample (laughs) of uh, a little spanish mixed chant Qué tal los amigos, bienvenidos para ver los carros aquí. En la vida de veinte, en la vida de veinte, veinte segundos más treinta, treinta segundos, cuarenta, cuarenta segundos más cincuenta, cincuenta, veintiuno, veintiuno para cincuenta segundos. ¿Está bien? Ah, uh, sure. Lo siento, pero yo necesito practicar mi español soy gringo. Uh, guacamole. ¿Qué más quieres, Captain? Yeah. Um, <coughs> the Ringman College is coming up. The World Champion Ringman College is coming up in Denver, Colorado, on October the fourth through the sixth. Yes. And that's going to be at the Drury Inn in Denver. Um, uh, Vaughn Long. Yes. And Sean Hagler. Yes, sir. And I had, I had met Sean evidently, but you know how it is at these conventions. You meet people and and you, it's hey how are you? Shake mm-hmm. hands and and you don't ever have a conversation with them. Well, I just had a conversation with Sean and uh, in Waco at the Texas convention that we just had and and had a great conversation. I really like him a lot, mm-hmm. and I think he's he's. Um, obviously very good at what he does and and just seems to be a great guy i'm i'm excited about your your ringman college and and uh so I, i'm i'm formally announcing to uh, the world here that we have 
we have reached an agreement to support and work with um, the Ringman College, the world champion Ringman College, because I, I believe in what you're doing, and I know you know what you're doing. That you know that's part of it. You, yeah. I I, uh, I I don't endorse things I don't believe in, but one thing that I uh, we are going to try to coordinate uh, having the Ringman College. Of course, you'll be doing your deal in Denver, but I would like to piggyback it at some point uh, as a follow-up class immediately after auction yeah, school. Just, yeah. That's good. Uh, so people, when they're already in town, you know, it's an eight, nine-day school. Well, if they can stay, in, stay three more days mm -hmm. and get that education too, I think um, it's a lot easier for people to do it one time than to have to break the class up and then travel right. again and all that. So, right. yeah, I'm pretty excited about that. It's going to be great. So congratulations on that. Thank you. I um, yeah, I don't think anybody's interested in it. it it's all hands on. Yep. Um, and, and you know, Sean and uh, Vaughn had the, had the idea and first started the school and brought us on board to, to come instruct. And, and we got more involved and ended up helping a lot with the curriculum and, and a lot of the drills and things that we do. And um, we're, I'm really, really happy with what we've turned out. And you know, every time we have school, it's just getting better and better. It's Sweet. Good. I know, Angie, we have the Lone Star bid, uh, Open Bid Calling Championship here in Texas coming up. We do. Uh, tell me about that real quick. Uh, October 25th, uh, it'll be held with uh, in conjunction in Fort Worth with the Red Steagall Festival. Um, and we have, they just opened uh, or actually increased the jackpot of that contest to $10,000 this year. So that's huge. We went from 5000 prize money last year to 10000 this year. So super excited about that. And it's going to be a great competition. I'm in. I know. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> it's um, going to be awesome. Yeah. You know the problem about being a champion auctioneer? You only have one place to go. Right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, it's um, funny because we get a lot, you know, from the board about people wanting from, you know, neighboring states that don't have a, a licensing laws or, or an association or whatever to want to come in and compete mm -hmm. for the Texas auctioneer, you know, title, you know, or the state title. And, uh, you know, the TSLO is just – you know our way of being able to have a you know texas contest that can encompass you know anybody that wants to enter it and well that is becoming the norm you know I would, you know there's a, a midwest contest and mm -hmm. the bluegrass or whatever i mean it's, i think these regional contests are, are a good thing and it, it showcases uh well what the auctioneers do and of course we do it in fort worth is mm -hmm. that where we're doing it again it is uh -huh. yeah. yes sir and we usually do it are we doing it in coordination with red steve yes sir yeah mm -hmm. red steve the great country singer and poet country laureate mm -hmm. and uh i think that's a great uh, it's just a really neat idea and it's a neat place to do it too it is it's a neat atmosphere mm -hmm. it's really cool yeah okay once again uh world champion ringman uh, uh school the ringman college is going to be october the 4th through the 6th at the drury inn in denver colorado i highly recommend that anyone that wants to get going in the auction business um, attend learn all you can and and again it's another network of people too to get yes. involved with because you never know who you're going to meet at these classes right any final thoughts before we cut you loose no, I just uh, thank you very much for having us and enjoyed. I'm 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 can't believe there's a couple of stories you hadn't heard before. But <laughs> there's there's <laughs> Craig with you. There's always a couple of stories. <laughs> We've and, had a, and you thank you so much for being for here. Yeah, and uh, Craig, of course, um, you're just like my kids, and and it's it's been awesome. It's been awesome. So I thank you very much and thank continue you. to do the good things and the good works that you do because it will come back to you tenfold. On behalf of everybody that's been a part of this one in Dallas, we thank you so much for being a part of the Mike McGavell Jones Show. We hope you come back and see us next time. Uh, it's every week, and uh, it's a beautiful day if you wake up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So from Dallas, Texas, we bid you adieu from Dallas at Lincoln Center. God bless. Later. <laughs>